All right. We now know that our goal is to understand how to use sequent calculus as a calculus. That's a method of computing something. And to do that, I want to compare it to some of the ways we compute naturally in other systems, like numbers. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's a good way to make sure we start to understand what we're doing. So we're going to end with things like implies and exist and uniqueness and all these other kinds of things we could do in logic. But right now, just stick with numbers like 8 plus 2. But we all know what the answer should be. 8 and 2 combined be 10. And we should likewise take negative 12 and call it minus 12. Is that really all there is to it? Well, no, it's much more subtle than that. The truth is, I don't know what 8 should be. Perhaps 8 is meant to be the character 8, like the button on your keyboard. And the number 2 is another button. Perhaps this should have been 82. Maybe that's what plus means. It just means to glue them together. How would we know that I wanted 10 instead of 82? It's context. It's always context. We have to put context in if we expect to explain to anybody else what's logical to us. So what's the context here that would mean that 8 and 2, when added together, aren't the, the number 82, but are the number 10? It would be addition as natural numbers, as counting numbers. So the implicit context here that I fooled you into thinking about without even telling you was the natural numbers. But a computer might get confused and demand some explanation. So let's give it to them. If you're in mathematics circles, you use the bold-faced end. Both 8 and 2 derive their meaning in this context as natural numbers. And the result is the natural number 10 entailed by, or 10 is entailed in the natural numbers. This is different from having done it with characters. If I wanted to do the same thing with ASCII text, I could do something like ASCII or perhaps Unicode, some coding system, some alphabet, could give me the meaning of eight, and it could also give me the meaning of two, and then together, I would get the meaning of 82. That's the key differences we're giving ourselves. By putting in the natural numbers, we've made it clear which one we want. And it also helps us explain what's going on here. You might say 12 is pretty easy to negate, but is it easy to negate if all you can do is count upwards? Certainly not. There is no negative 12 if you start counting from zero upwards. So we would need to expand the context to include negatives. Natural numbers don't do that. We move to the integers. I'll remind you that mathematicians like to use the letter Z. Now, it's not important that you use Z or N. You can write the letters uint for unsigned integer or nat for natural number or int for Z. All these other substitutes are great for programs. But on a chalkboard and between ourselves, we like to adopt some of the nature of which mathematicians have been good at because it makes nice short things and connects you to the atmosphere of other reasoning. Now let's switch over to logic. What if I want A and B? We can't even say it without using the word and. It's so close to a basic operation in language. So A and B becomes this. All that we've really done here is tell each other what symbol we're using for and. You could use an ampersand, the word and, any number of symbols. I'll be using this upside down looking V. It's called wedge or conjunction. Once more, if we're really being precise, we really should tell each other where these happen to be true. In the context gamma, A was true. In the context gamma, B was also valid. If both A and B are valid, true, in gamma, then they are both simultaneously true and we say A and B is valid. Let's draw a picture to go with this. One of the things that we could do is we can see that over here we combined 8 and 2 to get 10. A natural picture for this might be something like this. We could do 8, 2 with a plus sign to do 10. Or we could draw it upside down as well. Or we could draw it sideways. Don't get hung up on how exactly we write it. Just keep track of the structure. The structure is a tree. From every two vertices, we have a unique path. If I put my finger here and here, I'd have to go through 10 and come down. If I put my fingers here and there, there's only one path to 10. This uniqueness is the key structure about explaining our arguments well. If we put in a tree, there's a fact that every tree has the property that you can put your finger on one vertex and somewhere else on the other vertex, and there's only one shortest path between them. Anything else would have to backtrack. We can only get from one place to another in a unique way. That uniqueness is baked into the theory of sciences. We want everyone to read our data and understand it the same way. If there's only one way to get to the conclusion, 
Well, then we're going to guarantee that everyone agrees with us because we baked into the nature of our explanation one unique path down there. Now, of course, this is only true in sequent calculus where we strip away all the natural language tricks. Be careful. A proof with natural language can fool you because it can have a lot of distracting words and things that you might get away with in common speech. We're trying to come up with a language to talk to each other without those distractions. So a picture for this one will look like this. We put A and B together. And we can highlight that with whatever symbol is needed. Now, I like to think about these as coming in two flavors. Because we have operations that introduce a symbol, we also have operations that use them, consume them, or eliminate them. So this here is an introduction. So I like to put an I on it to remind myself this is about making that symbol. So wherever I draw this picture, I'll put I and then the ampersand, this upside down wedge. Well, speaking about using it, how do we use A and B? If we have A and B, one of the things we get out of it is A. I want you to think about this as an operation quite similar to negative. The negative is simply taking 12 and turning it into some other piece of data. I want to take the data A and B and turn it into just the data A. Because this got rid of it, I'll call that an elimination rule. It's an elimination of the ampersand. Trouble is, there's two of them. I just got B out of A and B. That's okay. Two elimination rules is allowed. In fact, is what we've used all our lives. Every time we think of 10, we're doing two elimination rules. Take a look at the zero. That's the digits column. We read that when we want to know how close to a digit it is. Whenever we want to know its total magnitude in tenths column, we eliminate to that second component. How many tens does it have? If we had a third component, that'd be how many hundreds it has. What we do with decimal numbers is we pack all that information in in a nice, concise way so we can develop good reasoning about those pieces. Then, when we need them, we strip out the pieces that are important to our application. If we want a rough guess, we might remove those decimal pieces down here because they're not as significant as the higher. If we're trying to see where it's going to round up or down, we might concentrate on the last digit. All of these have different uses. But nevertheless, we want to label these elimination rules with slightly different notation so we can keep track of which is which. I like to put a symbol on the side that I'm keeping. So I'm keeping the A side, I put the symbol there. I put the symbol over there if I want to get rid of the B side or the A side. Pictures to go with this would be similarly to draw just a twig to get me back the A and a twig, an edge, to get me back the B. Here's a little trick you can do when you expect to do both. You can try to add a little bit of left and right jogs to your picture. If that's not enough for your reader to read, nothing hurts you from putting in just the name of the operation. Eliminate on the left, eliminate on the right. When you program, you'll discover there's a lot of elimination rules that have some structure like this. They'll say something like the left value, the right value, the first value, the second value. It might be an array, array one, array two, it might be dot one, dot two. These kinds of things are all ways of trying to get information out when it's been put together in multiple pieces. It's a way of drawing pictures to describe the sequence calculus. So let's kick it off with implication. The first one I'm going to look at is modus ponens. This is how we use implication. So it's an elimination rule. It's trying to consume whatever made that true. What made it true? We always have to remember there's a context. The context could be added to that. And it's important, especially in implication, because we saw that oftentimes we can be misled. We can have something that's not valid leading to something valid. And that doesn't sound logical at all. But the reality is, it's not that A has to lead to B, it's that A together with the context. So if B was already true in the context, then who cares what A does? However, what we definitely disallow in implication is that if A was valid, we shouldn't get B being invalid. So that's what this sentence is meant to say. If I have A implying B and I find out that A is valid, I get to conclude that B is also valid. So if we put in the context, we would say that the context made A valid and together the context made B valid. Let's try to draw a picture to explain what this is doing. Again, we try to draw the pieces of the data and collect them into the result. The result in this case, the conclusion is B. So there's a bottom of our tree. We're only trying to make a tree. Now, what should be the twigs of the tree? Well, one of the options is to use the A, and the A implies B. Here, this A and B also has a context, and so does A. So where did that context actually go in my diagram? And since it's so important for implication, 
we'll definitely want to get that setting figured out. One of the solutions graphically is, since gamma is going to be the same everywhere, why don't we just treat that as the background color of our paper? Imagine that we thought of this as a piece of pink paper. And everything we write on pink paper is about pink context. And pink context could have all the rules that are necessary, like natural numbers or integers. If we change the context, we just change the color. Integers might be on pink paper, uh, natural numbers on yellow paper, um, printing cues could be on blue paper. Whatever the different contexts are, we just change the background and then everybody knows the context. And that's often how I visualize implicit context. I don't have to be told every detail, but I can see that I'm reading the file and the file is written in Java or C++ or Haskell or HTML or any other number of programming languages. Those subtle cues tell me to think about the entire program as colored one background color, one context. So I'll keep that picture and just label the entire page as context gamma. That way I don't lose track of it, but I don't have to put it in everywhere. You could put arrows on it to indicate the data came in to produce B. Another thing you could do is you could just call this eliminate there, right? We could give the operation the name elimination and then put the arrow on it. And that helps us remember that it's a coming out of. Whichever way you choose to do it, or even a mix of both, is all right. If you use the arrows, you can get away with just calling that the implied sign. What about the other one? If we're going to eliminate a symbol, we're also going to make it. That calls for an introduction. So this one over here is to introduce implication. It's like our negative sign. It just needs one premise, and then it produces the conclusion. The conclusion in this case is that A applies B. Crucially, though, we know that A doesn't have to apply B. We just know that context together with A produces B. And so context now entails the implication A, B. So whether you think of it with the background in there explicitly or not is up to you. But be mindful that every now and then, especially when talking to somebody new at this, you'll want to help them out with the context being explicit. What's a picture for this? Once more, I set the background to gamma, coloring the entire page by whatever the context is. Then I need to somehow describe A and B being implied. That's the result of this. But the trouble is there's only one premise. The premise is A entails B. So why did I draw two twigs? The answer is I wanted a hint myself. While I could have written just a single premise here, it wouldn't have told me what's really mechanically happening here, because I see that this is a premise within a premise. There really are two pieces to this operation. There's an A and a B, and I'd like to see those parts. So if I put A here and B, B and A there, I can see those parts. But now I introduce confusion. Think back to our AND. That was the way we introduced AND. So now our picture looks almost the same. The only difference is the symbol that we might put between them. And you could call that enough, but there's a subtle difference that I want to really draw out to my reader, which is that I don't know that A is valid. Over here, if I draw A and B, I'm telling everybody that A is valid. And that might be a conclusion which implication shouldn't make. Implication doesn't require this to be true. It just requires that B to be true inside the context of gamma and A. So A might even be false. To help draw that difference out, I like to put some kind of notation around this, such as square brackets or angle brackets, to think of it as a parameter. It's a possibly there component. It might not be there. It's kind of like an optional term. So having decorated this side, I can now see the visible difference in my picture from the and and from implication. Two different pictures. They'll help me not get confused. Let's close it out with or. Or, remember, is and turned upside down. We call that a V, or, con or disjunction. The disjunction part is that we don't know where things come from when we make an or. I can form A or B, and I really don't know whether it was A or B that made it true. In this case, I'm saying that A would be enough to make it true, but so would it be. The result is that what we're creating here is a language in which we kind of don't know how it got made, but once it's made, we know that one of these two paths was used. Either it was A or it was B, and that's what or means, right? To use it, however, we needed the disjunctive dilemma. The dilemma was, I don't know what's actually going on. Who made A or B? But what if I have A leads to C and B leads to C, and then I have A or B? Well, then I know I get C. 
So let's see if we can draw some pictures to help us remember these data. And we'll start to see the differences with AND. Up here, the picture is kind of like a negative sign. So we just need a single twig. There's one premise and one conclusion. So I could draw that as A leading to A or B. And that introduction rule, I'll put on the side that we used it on. This introduction rule, I'll put the star on the other side. And if you don't want to draw the eye, you can draw an arrow. Both of these pictures communicate these two different introduction rules in a somewhat effective way. If you need to, you could always have a key on the side of your diagrams helping to explain it to your reader. What about a diagram for this? It's a little bit more tricky because there's actually three premises now. All of these are taking place in the same context, the same background sheet of paper, but we see one, two, and three inputs to derive C. So we'll have C at the bottom, and then we'll have three pieces of information that all come together. So what we have here is that A has to lead to C. We also have that B leads to C, and then we also have that A or B is true. If we draw it like this, we see now that the data is taking three terms and combining them to C. In fact, we could go one step further. Just like we did here, we think of A as optional. We could break these up into two separate parts, where we have A is optionally there, and when it's there, it leads to C. And here we have B optionally there, and when it's there, it leads to C. We've now made it very clear that we don't know whether A is true or B is true. We just know that they're together they're true. This piece right here captures this disjunctive dilemma. Notice that's far more complicated than how we produce ANDs. This is how we said earlier, ANDs and ORs don't really make perfect analogs of each other. The OR has to tell us which one it really was coming from in some disguised way. The disguised way here is that we think about how they could have branched to get to C by two different ways. That way, when the data of A or B comes in, we'll get C either way. Now, all of this is set up to try to, try to do a calculus. The key thing is, these pictures, when combined, can start to cancel and give us shortcuts to thinking about our reasoning. The pictures are just a placeholder for these symbols, but you start to see they build up a tree. And trees are excellent because trees have unique paths between vertices, which means if we arrange our arguments as a tree, we'll guide everyone to the very same conclusion. Provided we follow the logical operators, there'll be no way to say that there's a mistake in our proof. The only thing people could quibble with is whether they want to work on orange, green, yellow, or red paper. They could change the paper color and change the argument, but if they agree to our paper color and our steps are valid, there's no one who could find a mistake. Let's see how that works out. That's how you take care of your chalkboard.